the Tom and Doug Show. Thomas. Hi, Doug. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I don't notice very much. I try not to because once you notice it, then people think you've got to react to it, and then that's too much pressure. Well, maybe I should not tell you this. It's about my ear hair. You you could do a comb over. I know, I know. <laughs> Believe me, you know the person who cuts my hair thinks that I am epic in the world of ear hair. <laughs> if there was going to be like an Oscar or an Academy Award for ear hair, I would definitely get it. This I've is true. I've actually had somebody yell at me about my ear hair. Like, don't ever come back into this haircutting place with ear hair like that again. <laughs> I've had somebody do that to me. Weird. Oh, I've got something to say. Oh, I've got something to say. And I'm not going to say it twice. And I'm not going to say it here. And I'm not going to say it nice. And I'm not going to use my brain. And I'm not going to use my hand. And I'm not going to waste your time. If you're not going to understand. Oh, I've got something to say. And it's breaking my heart because. Oh, I've got something to say. If I only knew what it was. I've got something to say. And it's never been said before. It'll never be said again. So let's say it all just once more. Oh, I've got something to say. And I'm not gonna say it twice. And I'm not gonna say it here. I'm not gonna say it nice. And I'm not gonna use my brain. And I'm not gonna use my hand. And I'm not gonna waste your time. If you're not gonna understand. Oh, I've got something to say. Oh, I've got something to say. I've got something to say. Oh, I've got something to say. Oh, I've got something to say. So, Tom. Yes. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Uh -oh. I kind of have a. A, a pretty high opinion of myself. Really? Yeah. I, I realize this because when I think about things that I have contributed to in some way, I often feel like, well, I should save that. Oh, right? okay. Because maybe someday someone's going to want to see it. I remember as even a young person, like writing my diary as a teenager, and oh my God, they're horrible. Um, but thinking like someone's going to want to read this someday. Well, I think part of that is the idea, I, I did some of that too, is that you have this idea that you're going to live for a long, long, long time. And uh, once you realize that you really don't, <laughs> <laughs> when you get to the point where you're dealing with people that you were close to you that died, and you understand what happens to your life when you die and how you disperse these things. So these kinds of things that we thought were so important wind up mm, being maybe slightly less important yeah. to people after you're gone. <laughs> they basically get thrown in the dumpster. Yeah. Yeah. But I wish I had that excuse. But okay. I basically had no one die when I was young. So okay. why was I already thinking about leaving 
things for biographers. Or... Yeah, you didn't realize that nobody's going to care about that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, on the coffee table in front of you, there's an AARP magazine with uh, Michael Douglas on the cover. You know who else is in this magazine? Marcus Welby? Me. Wait, is it the centerfold? <laughs> it is folded. Oh, out. don't. You should have warned me. <laughs> No, but it's... What's it, Boris doing in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So it's just some interview I did. The magazine is still there like six months after it showed up at my house. And it's like, should I throw this away? Should I not throw this away? You know, are my daughters going to want to see these things that I was involved in? And the answer, of course, is no. But I don't feel like I can just throw it out for some reason oh i have stuff like that that's that goes under the the title of scrapbooking you never know what's important until the time that you discover that it's important so i don't feel guilty about keeping stuff like that what there's something you don't feel guilty about well right, something's right, wrong with should, that i think I you should, should feel guilty, should about, feel that. guilty <laughs> about that yeah <laughs> it's not so much guilty it's just for whom am i saving this you know uh, i have a uh, a bookshelf in my office that has various journals or books or things that I've written something in. And, you know, here's this, uh, this whole section that has the things for me, but no one's going to care. Well, for me, I think what it is, is I always have the illusion that I'm going to come back and do something with this material. So I have a lot of unfinished projects or potential projects. And I, I was always like that. I always felt like, oh, when I have time, I might want to do this. Or when I'm, I have time, I might want to do that. You have all these possibilities that you say, well, someday this may be of use to me. And then as you get older and older, you start to say, no, it's unlikely that that's ever going to be of <laughs> use to me. Uh, so you can kind of let go of a few things i remember our hubris as young people we wrote our first song together in 1985 by 1987 we have a recording and there's talk in front of it saying well this is for the you know the box set <laughs> that someone will make a the retrospective of the outtakes it was a joke when we said it <laughs> maybe for well for me it was a joke i was saying well you know this is goofy. And I, I remember I was pointing out the similarity of the stupidity that winds up on box sets That's with the true. stupidity that we were just doing. <laughs> <laughs> Entirely true. So there was sort of a humor thing going on there. Sorry, I'll keep the note in my head. Okay, Mr. Doug. Professional. We're rolling, huh? Hey, press pause. <laughs> okay. Is he ready out there? Yeah, we're rolling. Oh. Oh. It's been No, no, no. A oh, we start from the It's Been A? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, good. Sorry. One. Where do you want to start from? No, that's good. All right. <laughs> Once upon a time, it was a hard <laughs> day's <laughs> <Okay. laughs> night. Boy, Elvis. <laughs> okay. We're going to have a lot of stuff to put on our box set, won't they? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, keep going. <laughs> It's been a hard day's night And I've been working like a dog It's been a hard day's night I should be sleeping like a log But when I get home to you I find the things that you do will make
this is Boris. I just wanted to say Tom and Doug are outstanding in their field. Tom, do you ever play the lottery? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. My grandfather taught me how to play. He taught me the instant lottery is the most fun because, first of all, it's instant, right? So you get gratification at exactly the moment you want it. Uh, you don't have to wait for you know some Powerball thing to happen. So let me show you how. Because there's a special technique, and he taught it to me. Win every time. Now you can play like just a dollar or ten dollars. Uh, it, it feels different depending on how you do it. Ready? Take it. <laughs> oh, yeah. winner every time. Mystery date, are you ready for your mystery date? Don't be late, it would be great. <laughs> Open the door for your mystery date. It's mystery date.
date, the thrilling new Milton Bradley game of romance and mystery that's just for you. And you. And you. And you. Mystery date. Will you be ready for swimming? Or a dance? When you open the door, will your mystery date be a dream? Or a dud? Oh! Fun and surprises. That's mystery date. Remember, Milton Bradley makes the best games in the world. So, girls, open the door for your mystery date. Get mystery date. Hi, we're back on the show, and we're talking about, what the heck are we talking about? <laughs> we're talking about our high opinion of ourselves, oh. where we think that other people are going to want to listen to us like this radio show. <laughs> yeah, you have this imaginary idea of who your audience is. So you're doing this music with the idea that somebody's going to hear it. At least I do. When I do music, I feel like, well, somebody's going to hear this. So you don't really know. It's almost like life because you don't really know how people react to what you say. You don't really know how people are going to react. I always liked Fiona Apple. In one of her interviews, she says that she felt that she was going to be able to make music and then people would understand her. She had lived under the illusion that she would create all these songs exposing how she felt about things and she could just walk into a room and everyone would understand who she was. It never occurred to her that people would misunderstand the songs. <laughs> and that was to her horror she found that out. So how about you? You write similarly, I think, that you have something you want to communicate. Are you grateful when people actually understand it or are you horrified when they actually understand it? Well, I write the song with the idea that somebody's going to understand a part of me, but when they actually confront me with their understanding of this song, that feels a little too creepy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I've gotten that. I've learned when I, when I think I really understand what you're saying in some songs, I become more cagey about it because I don't really want to let you know how much I understand about this because <laughs> then you're going to feel awkward. But on the other side is I have had songs written by other people that exposed so many amazing things to me. So the idea that I could be comforted in a way by music or just the idea that somebody else felt this right. was fascinating and, and wonderful. So the idea that I could write something that could make somebody feel that way is really kind of encouraging or it makes you want to do that. You've often made it clear to me. Uh-oh, I'm not supposed to make anything clear these days. <laughs> <laughs> that you actually want people to hear because it comes from a place where you've got something that you want to express and the expression alone isn't enough. It also needs to be received. When I'm writing the songs, I'm always thinking that this is a, something that I'm doing for somebody. I'm, I'm communicating this to somebody else. So it does bother me if, if, it, if nobody ever hears the song. That's that interesting. See, because I do it entirely for myself. And if no one ever hears it, that's fine. I, I entertained myself. Well, uh, that's why being on the radio is really good for me. It's probably good <laughs> for most people on community radio because you get the feedback of knowing that you're on the radio, but you don't get, have to deal with the feedback of anybody misunderstanding you. So as far as I'm concerned, every Everybody got everything that I'm saying. Everybody <laughs> understood all the songs. That's what I tell Very myself. Very nice. Yeah. This song we wrote about a year ago when uh, I went out to visit my mother in New Jersey, and Tom came up to, uh, to visit, and as mothers do when they don't get to see you more than once a year, she asked us to clean her gutters. <laughs> <laughs> So, I have a terrible fear of heights, uh, but, you know, it's my mom, what are you going to do? So, uh, Jennifer wasn't there to do it. You know. <laughs> Kristen, yeah, she wasn't there either, so it was us. And so I climb up the ladder, I'm up on her roof, and the view was amazing. This song is about it. I stood at the base and I looked up toward the sky I took a deep breath and then I started to climb At first the goal seemed so far, so far out of reach One step beyond 
and I was flying. Each step brings new perspectives, each breath a brand new life. Each laugh is so infectious, each path a great new sight. The air so clear that I think that I can see forever. I see so far, I see my doom. Oh, just like my dreams, I'm floating on air. Just like my dreams, I wake up so scared. You might think that I'm silly, I walk without a care. This trail is deep and hilly, I rise into the air. The sky's so bright and perfect, the birds can sing along. I see so far, I see my doom. Just like my dreams, I'm floating on air. Just like my dreams, I wake up so scared. We can hold hands together, we can both skip along. And now we see forever, we know we can't be wrong. We near the peak and look out, the air so crisp and clear. We see so far, we see our doom. We see so far, we see our So, Tom, yep. I've listened to you today. Uh-oh. I've heard what you've had to say. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm validating your apology. I think it's a good day to apologize to all the listeners out there <laughs> who are tuning into the show and saying, we're really sorry. I'm not. Well, we You're going to want to save this show. Yeah we, you... yeah, we hope to be really sorry again next week for you again. So you guys tune back in and uh, have a good week. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Tom and Doug would like to remind you, you should be wowed with consumption. That's uh, buying stuff, not the way people used to talk about consumption. Who is eating or eating? Tuberculosis. Oh, is that what that was? Yeah, because uh, it would consume you from the inside. Now, tuberculosis is, I always, is that the one, which is that disease where they used to make you chill out for like a while? Yeah, they'd send you to a sanatorium. That always seemed like a really cool disease. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I suppose. Only, you know, it eats up your lungs and then you die. Uh, well, other than that, it seemed, it seemed like it would be a lot of fun to just have to <laughs> relax for several months. <laughs> the Tom and Doug Show. It's like a vacation for your ears. The Tom and Doug Show. It's like a vacation where we don't eat up your lungs and kill you. <laughs> 